Good morning. So today I'm here to talk to you about the minerals, just an introduction, of course, an hour that we have. We cannot do justice to these very important groups of nutrients, but I'll just introduce the topics and then we will focus on two of the minerals, two important ones that are calcium and iron. So as you recall from your earlier lectures, Minerals are inorganic elements, which is, means they are the only nutrients that do not contain carbon. They have no energetic function, so they do not significantly contribute, they do not contribute at all, in fact, to our energy requirement, much like vitamins. They have, however, very important structural and regulatory functions. Some minerals are part of structures in our body, like calcium in our bones, and all of them uh, are involved in one way or the other on hundreds of different metabolic pathways so regulate the activity of the structures in our body. And traditionally we classify the minerals in two different uh, groups depending on how much we need of them and how much we have in our body. We have seven major minerals meaning that we need more than 100 milligrams per day which is still a tiny amount if you compare to the macronutrients like the proteins, the carbs, the fats. <clears throat> and we have the trace minerals, which we need a lot less, less than 20 milligrams per day. So that's why we call them trace. We just need very small amounts. But that doesn't mean that they are any less important. They are, are as essential and as vital as the major minerals. We just need less because we have less in our body. We have nine that are recognized as essential, such as iron and zinc. All right, so this chart shows how much we have in our body of the minerals. As you can see, it's pretty variable. The uh, red bar is calcium. It's the most abundant mineral in our body. We have about 1,200 grams of it. Half as much phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, and magnesium. And those are the seven major minerals. And on the left part of your chart, we have some trace minerals. As you can see, we have a lot less. In our uh, average body, we have a few uh, milligrams of iron, manganese, copper, and iodide. A few grams, sorry. And again, that doesn't mean that they are any less important. We just have less, and so we need less uh, from food. This chart shows all the major minerals again. Uh, the trace minerals, chromium, fluoride. Fluoride is not strictly essential copper, iodide, iron, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, and zinc. And then there are some other uh, minerals that we need really, really small amounts, so, so tiny that we don't even have recommend intake for, for, for them. And we uh, refer to them sometimes as the ultra-trace mineral, meaning we really need a little amount. So this chart that you have in your book is just to appreciate how many different regulatory things the minerals do in our body. They are involved in cell metabolism, meaning basically every metabolic pathway, every reaction in your cell uh, often requires minerals as cofactors or other um, involvement in the pathways itself to uh, extract energy from food or build molecules or detoxify um, uh, xenobiotics, many other things. They are involved in bone health, in growth and development, in blood formation, in nerve transmission, in muscle contraction, in antioxidant defense, four of the minerals are essential uh, cofactors of our three major antioxidant <coughs> enzymes. In water and ion balance, the major minerals are electrolytes, so they drive water in and out of the cells, they create gradients, so, and all of them are essential. If we miss just one of the 16 essential minerals, life cannot be sustained. We need all of them, and we have to get them from food. Yes. Does that include the ultra trace minerals too? It, it depends. It, it's very hard to find out because it's not easy to get rid of the ultra trace mineral to do an experiment and see if without life can or not be sustained. So they are not defined as essential because it never happens that you don't have them. But they likely are. Yes. And so. Um, you can see that in the range of intake, we have a gap that 
uh, is the adequate intake, so the intake that is optimal for our health and to sustain life. If we have less than that, we may not have <coughs> symptoms, so we may not have overt deficiencies, but still have a suboptimal intake, meaning we do not have enough to uh, <coughs> get the optimal health of our body, to get the optimal <coughs> out of the minerals themselves. Maybe in the long term this could increase risk of disease or just make not the body work at its uh, best. Um, and if we go even lower than that, we will have clinical deficiencies. And that this means we really will have symptoms of mineral deficiency. And um, clinical deficiencies, luckily, at least in our uh, rich post-industrialized countries, are not very common, but that doesn't mean they do not exist. For example, iron deficiency anemia is a clinical nutritional deficiency. That's pretty common. But the real problem is suboptimal intakes. Those, even in the North America, Europe, are very common. There are a lot of minerals and a lot of vitamins for which our intake is not uh, optimal. So uh, we could use a little bit more. But on the other uh, end of the uh, chart here, you see if we have too much, we will have problems of toxicity. Chronic toxicity it means it's detrimental effect that will build over time by having too much of a mineral. And if we go even above that, at higher doses, we will have acute to toxicity. So we'll be sick from having too much of a mineral. And <coughs> this applies, of course, as you know, to every element, every nutrient, every substance, even water. We have no water at all. We die. We drink 20 liters at once. We die. But the problem for minerals is that the gap, like the, the range between what's too little and what's too much, oftentimes is pretty close. So it is easy to not get enough, but it is also easy to get too much, especially if we make like indiscriminate use of supplements. <coughs> the mineral content of foods is very variable. Um, it depends on the content of the soil and other environmental factors for plants. For animal food, depends on what they eat. And so, uh, it is very hard to know how much of them is in food and to determine how much we get from food. If you play with your software for diet analysis, you, you, you know how many assumptions and guesses you have to make just to <coughs> determine the proteins, the, the macronutrients, the energy, which ends up being a guesstimate at best. For the mineral, is even harder because oftentimes we don't even know how much of them is in the food. What we know is that the mineral content is lowered by refinement processes. This applies to whole grains. Whole grains can be a good source of minerals and vitamins, but not if they are refined. I don't know if you can see the numbers here, but it's a comparison for some minerals in uh, white unrich flour and whole wheat flour and white and brown rice. White flour has half the amount of calcium, uh, a third of the iron, 80% less magnesium, 80% less zinc, a fraction of copper and of manganese, less than half the selenium. And those are just a few, but this is for all the minerals, <coughs> all the, many of the vitamins. So whole grains can be a good source, but refined grain, not so much. And enrichment gives back only a tiny amount of that. So it, it cannot be compared to, to whole, whole grains. And rich flour is, they just give back some of them, usually the cheapest, but it is as enriched as you would be if I stole your 10 bucks and give you back 20 cents. It's, it's not very enriched. Uh, yes? Why does the white long grain rice have more iron? It's a, the iron went up. It does? Mm -hmm. It's got 1.2 right milligrams of iron versus 1.2 of gram long grain. Oh. Uh, it may be in this case that it gets, with the treatment, it, uh, it's just a guess. I don't know if you want it. But sometimes when you do the um, steam treatment of uh, rice to then refine it, the iron moves uh, within the center of it, so it, 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 it gets more concentrated, or it may just have been uh, added uh, afterwards to fortify it. Um, okay, mineral absorption is also variable, so we do not know how much we have in um, food, but even when we do, we do not know how much actually gets into our body. Only a fraction of the mineral in food uh, are absorbed, and it can be a, 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 low, uh, a low percent. For example, chromium is usually absorbed at less than 
but it is also a variable meaning that depending on the body needs, our body can dramatically increase the percent of minerals that are absorbed from food. So if it needed, it will take in more. It depends on the food matrix. It may make it easier or it may make it harder uh, for the mineral to get absorbed. There can be some substances that bind to the minerals, thereby uh, reducing their absorption. Oxalates in some vegetables like spinach, phytate in some whole grains, fiber, tannins in red wine and uh, tea. Uh, however, the problem with those substances is usually when you have sudden variation. So if you go from a low fiber diet to very high fiber, then you will have uh, trouble absorbing the minerals. But if you have a steady consumption of whole grains and fiber and vegetables, your uh, body can adjust and so it likely will not have problem absorbing the minerals it needs. There are competitions with other minerals because many times they have the same site for absorption. And so if we have too much of one, then we will not absorb the other because it will be displaced. For example, think zinc and copper. You take a zinc supplement, uh, you will end up displacing copper absorption. And interactions with other nutrients, with minerals, and they can be uh, they can increase or decrease absorption. There, for example, vitamin C uh, enhances the absorption of iron. Some uh, amino acids will bind to minerals and increase their absorption. All right, so we can move on to calcium. Uh, chalk, you can see here, it's calcium carbonate, so there's a lot of calcium in it. It's not a food source, of course. It is the most abundant element in our body, yes. Um, I just have a question. Isn't um, amino acids present in all minerals? Does that include I'm sorry, the amino acids plus? Plus minerals, but is that the case always that it increases absorption? No, not always. It was just an example. Some amino acid can bind some mineral and form a chelate, and that will be uh, more easily absorbed. Oftentimes, it's done in supplements. For example, if you want to, we said chromium has low absorption, but if you bind it to amino acid, it will be absorbed in the uh, absorptive way of amino acids and so it will be absorbed more. Um, so we have 1,200 uh, grams of calcium in our body. Most of it, 99%, is in our bones and in our teeth with structural functions, meaning it will strengthen uh, our bones and teeth, it will strengthen the, the protein matrix of, of our bones. The remaining 1% is mostly in our bloodstream and outside our cells. Inside our cells, we really have tiny, tiny amounts of calcium, but it is very, very powerful. So this little calcium that we have acts a little bit like dynamite. If it is strictly controlled, it can do very powerful things, but if it goes out of control, it's dangerous, um, which is why calcium is very strictly regulated in, inside our cells. For example, it is necessary for muscle contractions. It binds to troponin, so without calcium, we cannot contract our muscle. If we do not have calcium, our muscle cannot contract. So our diaphragm cannot contract, we cannot breathe, we die. We have too much calcium, our muscle will contract too much, disordinately, we will have heart arrhythmias and again, heart failure. So you see, we, there's not too much to play with calcium. We want it to be just about right. It is involved in nerve transmission. It is needed to release the neurotransmitters at your synaptic cleft. It is uh, necessary for blood clotting. It is a, a cofactor of prothrombin. It is involved in blood pressure regulation, so much so that calcium deficiency, calcium deficiency is a risk factor for hypertension. And it does many other things. So we said, because calcium is so important and it can be very useful, but also potentially very dangerous, it is very strictly regulated. It's actually the only mineral uh, to regulate the blood concentration of which we have not one, not two, but three different hormones. 
and we can regulate calcium by increasing or decreasing its absorption in the intestine, by increasing or decreasing its excretion, the uh, urine, and also by depositing or withdrawing it from our bones. In fact, calcium in our bones does not only have a structural function, it is also a deposit of calcium. When we do not have enough calcium from food, we can still maintain our blood calcium by stealing it from our bones. The three hormones that regulate calcium are those parathyroid hormones from our parathyroids, calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D, and um, which is activated in the kidneys, and calcitonin from our thyroid. So what happens if our blood levels of calcium drop, uh, parathyroid hormones will be released, it will activate vitamin D, and together they will increase absorption, decrease excretion, and if necessary, steal calcium from our bones to raise, of course, uh, calcium levels in our blood. On the other hand, if we have too much calcium in our blood, the enemy of those two previous hormones, calcitonin, will be released from our thyroid and will, that will do exactly the opposite. So it will increase excretion and push some of the calcium from our bloodstream into our bone, and thereby um, decreasing our blood concentrations of it. <clears throat> so again, if calcium intake is inadequate, these three hormones will work together and will still be able to maintain blood levels of calcium because it is so important to sustain life. But this will come at a high price for our bones because if we do this over the long term, we will keep stealing calcium from our bones and we will end up decreasing their strength. So we will have low bone mineral density and increased risk for osteoporosis. We will say a little bit about that later. And bone fracture. So it's definitely something that we do not want to do over and over again. Yes? Are there other altered trace minerals because um, <clears throat> involving yeah. bone health? No, well, I wanted to ask this earlier, but um, we have like trace amounts of gold. Oh, we do, like we do. Yes, yes. The, the question is can we survive without? Mm -hmm. We don't know because it's hard to find out. But we definitely we have trace amount of. A lot, a lot of minerals. Uh, everything that's so around. There's actually more than that was listed. There's actually more than. There was. There's more minerals. Oh, there's than. more. There's more that we have in our body than those shown in the chart. Yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. All right. So calcium absorption for food is about 25 percent on average. So one fourth. And again, if needed, we can go as high as 60%. So if we need more, we will try to absorb more because those two hormones that we showed before will start doing their job and increase calcium absorption. It is better absorbed in a slightly acidic environment. So with a meal, for example, you will have some acid from your stomach. If it is a supplement uh, taken uh, <coughs> far from the meals, it will have to be acidic like calcium citrate. It requires adequate level of vitamin D, as we already mentioned. And it naturally decreases with aging. So as you will see, the calcium requirement is a little bit higher as you age, because you, you need it and more and more, but you will absorb less. You will have harder time absorbing it uh, through your intestine. There are some dietary factors that will reduce absorption of, factor of calcium, so they will work against our meeting our needs for calcium. Uh, uh, like we said before, this applies to calcium absolutely. Sudden increases in fiber, phytic, oxalate, and tannins will uh, decrease calcium absorption, but we can adjust if we have a stable consumption. and excess dietary phosphorus to dietary calcium. Ideally, we want a one-to-one -one ratio, calcium with phosphorus, so a, a gram of phosphorus for every gram of calcium that we have from food. 
The problem with phosphorus in our diet is usually a problem of access. We tend to have too much because it's uh, widespread in food, but also it is part of many fertilizers, so it will end up in fruits and vegetables. Uh, it is present in many food additives, phosphoric acid in uh, cola beverages, um, polyphosphates in many cheeses and uh, processed meat. So chances are most of us are getting more phosphorus that we need compared to how much calcium we get. And this is a problem because it will end up uh, decreasing the absorption of calcium. There are also some dietary factors that work against uh, calcium requirement by this time increasing its urinary excretion. And the two major uh, dietary factors that increase calcium excretion are high protein diets and excess salt consumption, especially if we do those two things together with low intake of fruit and vegetables. And this is because uh, excess proteins need to be metabolized, uh, as you already know from our body. This generates acids that need to be buffered to maintain stable pH in our blood. And normally our kidneys do that without any problem, but if we exceed the homeostatic ability of our kidneys with excess uh, proteins to catabolize. We may have to steal some calcium from our bones to buffer the acids, make salts, and flush them out. But in this way, of course, we lose calcium. And same happens, and, and, and fruit and vegetables, uh, because they have the same buffering ability, they, they, they raise pH in our blood, they uh, spare the calcium. So that's why uh, we, we mentioned them together. And salt does the same. The culprit is not sodium in this case, it is actually chloride because it has the same acidifying effect in our blood. And to a much lesser extent, also abuse of caffeine will increase calcium excretion. So how much do we need of it? Um, we do have now uh, a recommended daily allowance for calcium. It's one gram. Um, in a, because the absorption decreases with age, it's slightly higher uh, in older men and women. So it goes high to 1,200 milligrams. The average intake is a little bit lower in the US. We also have an upper limit because we said we, we, we want calcium, but too much is also a bad thing. And that's uh, 2,500 milligrams. So pretty close. It's 2.5 times the uh, uh, recommended intake. It is easy, like we said, to get not enough, but it, it can be also easy to get too much, especially with the trend that we have uh, in our food supply to fortify uh, many foods with calcium where we maybe don't expect to find it. It's even lower after 50, so 1,200 grams. Yes? Why does it go down after 50 if your ability to absorb it goes down? Uh, I'm sorry? Why does the upper limit go down after 50 if your ability to absorb it also goes down? It, it, it is assumed. You, you mean the upper limit? Yeah, the upper limit. See, you see, yeah, you see, it gets even closer. The requirement goes a little bit higher because of that, but it is expected that the detrimental effect of having too much is also increases. So you want to make sure. And, 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 and yes, it's, it's pretty close. <coughs> so why uh, we don't want too much? There is different reasons. As soon as we start having uh, even slightly more calcium that we need, we will reduce vitamin D activation. If you remember, vitamin D uh, is a hormone that, uh, when activated, increases calcium absorption. So it makes perfect sense that if we have high enough calcium in our blood, we do not need to activate vitamin D because we don't need to absorb more. We already have it. And this would be perfectly fine if the only function of vitamin D was to absorb calcium. But as it turns out, Vitamin D does many other things. There's many other secondary effects that we keep finding out. Vitamin D is a hot topic in nutrition right now. Every day we find something new. It activates a lot of genes. It has the potential to prevent many diseases. And so if we overdo it with calcium, we suppress vitamin D activation, we miss out on some of the potential secondary benefits of vitamin D. Uh, we go higher, we can interfere with the absorption of some minerals, such as zinc and iron. We go even higher, we can increase our risk of kidney stones. And I say higher, but it's still around slightly more than the upper limit. So it's easy to do that. And to be honest, even 
um, if you have too little calcium, you will increase your risk of kidney stones for a different reason, because you cannot buffer your oxalate. But if you have too much, of course, you increase your risk. You go even higher, you will have soft tissues calcification. You're, you start calcifying your soft tissues. And you go even higher, you will have chronic and then acute toxicity from high amounts of calcium, like we said before. A problem with muscle contraction, nerve transmission. When you cannot move because you cannot transmit signals, so calcium is needed to release neurotransmitters. When you release too much because you have too much calcium and they cannot be reuptaken, you, are, you cannot move, you cannot contract muscles, you cannot transmit nerve signals, and then you die. <laughs> because you cannot breathe. <laughs> so where do we find it? In yogurt, milk, and cheese. Of course, they are rich sources of calcium. Is that a problem for a vegan? No, it is not, because we also have uh, plenty of calcium in green leafy vegetables and in whole grains. And again, there is all the anti-nutrients, but again, our body can adjust. We have a lot of calcium in almonds. Uh, fish with bones, if you think about it, when you eat smaller fish like sardine, you eat the bones. Sometimes in the in canned salmon, it, it's not a nice thought, but you know everything goes in it, including the bones, but at least you get calcium. Um, there can be waters that are very rich in calcium, and so they can contribute uh, to our need. Tofu, if it's made with calcium carbonate, with chalk, and this is not the soft, silky, but the strong tofu. And then many foods tend to be fortified, can be fortified with calcium, orange juice, soy milk, breakfast cereals. And again, remember that we want to make sure we get enough, but we also want to make sure we don't get more than we need. Um, does the calcium intake also vary depending on your um, before and after my size? Yes. For, for, a, for a baby, it would be very easy to overdose for the bigger you are, the harder it is. Of course, when, we, when we define the upper limits, it's of course it's an average for adults, for, for children it's more, but then of course it varies. When we uh, think of calcium, we cannot um, forget to talk about bone health, because it's an association we, we, we always do. Calcium is uh, needed for our bone, which is of course true, because it's part of the structure of our bones. But make no mistake, calcium is not everything about bone health. It's not, there, there's much more to it. So just having a lot of calcium doesn't inherently guarantee healthy bones. And, and this is an old um, epidemiological study from the Harvard School of Public Health that shows, it showed two things. Uh, so on your y-axis, you have the incidence of hip fractures, and you can see you are you win. So the United States is one of the highest <laughs> rates of um, hip fractures together with Australia. That's not there. New Zealand. And the other thing is on your x-axis you have uh, per capita calcium consumption. So you can see Finland has a lot of calcium consumption. It's as high as 1,500 grams, but they have an average rate of uh, bone fractures. What's even more interesting is that the countries that have very low uh, calcium intake, about half the RDA are actually the countries that have the lowest rate of hip fractures. Um, so it's not, it's, it, if you were to figure out a trend, actually you would think the opposite. From what it looks like here is the more calcium you get, the more fractures you have. This, of course, is misleading, but it, it could be explained if you think that these countries uh, that are part of Asia, they have low calcium intake because culturally they do not drink milk as adults at all, and so that's why they have low calcium intake. And yet they don't have high rate of bone fracture. The other countries, they are the high milk and dairy and cheese consumers. This probably goes together with high protein diets. And as we said before, high protein diet will end up um, inducing calcium excretion. So they have a lot of calcium, but lo and behold, they also have high incidence of <coughs> bone fractures because they may end up flushing out more than they actually bring um, in. For the same reason, bone health is also not just a milk story. Milk is a good source of calcium. But that's about it. Drinking milk does not guarantee health of your bones. Uh, although this is a concept, especially here in the United States, that's banged in your heads since kindergarten. 
But if you see from this study and this uh, part from uh, data from the nurses' health study, so a big epidemiological study from Harvard School of Public Health, you see that the nurses drinking less than one glass per, uh, of milk per week, they had a risk of fracture of one. The nurses drinking more than two glasses per day, they had 50% more risk of uh, bone fractures. So again, that's, that's clearly not the whole story. Um, bone health is a whole diet and lifestyle story. So you don't need to write this down, but it's just to show you how many different nutrients are involved in uh, bone health. You, you need adequate protein for your bone structure, phosph phosphorus, magnesium, fluoride, zinc, copper, silicon, boron, vanadium, vitamin A, D, K, C. Some of them are involved in the protein matrix of our bones. Some other, like calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, uh, fluoride, in the crystals that strengthen our bones. And like we said before, we also do not want too much protein, salt, caffeine, phosphorus, vitamin D, alcohol, which is toxic for our bones. We need to exercise our bones with weight-bearing physical activity, so that activity whereby our bones have to carry the weight of our body. Um, walking, running, um, which is the reason why astronauts will have a uh, problem of losing bone mineral density, because without gravity, that their bones do not have to carry the weight of the body. And it's possible at any age also some resistance physical activity, which doesn't need to be exotic, but just like light weight lifting or uh, rubber bands for older people, that will certainly help a lot to uh, healthy bones. No smoking, because smoking lowers estrogen levels, and estrogens are hormones that uh, increase deposition, so promote uh, bone deposition. Um, a healthy body weight, and this is one of those occasions where a low body weight, an underweight, or a slender body field, but that's genetic, will actually is considered a risk factor. It will increase chances of fractures. And again, there are regular menstruations because of the estrogens. They just contribute to uh, bone deposition. And, and that's the case of menopause, but there are also uh, female athletes, maybe younger, that will have interruption of menstrual cycle. Anorexia nervosa can result into that. And so that will also end up being detrimental for the health of your bone. So the bone mineral density, so how much minerals you have to strengthen your bones, varies with um, your age. You can see here, let's just uh, focus on the blue line. It increases very rapidly in your, the first 20 years of your life, and then it keeps increasing, but much slower uh, uh, until about 30, at which point it peaks. So this is as, as high as you can get in your life. After that, it starts declining slowly, but steadily. Uh, for women, up until menopause, after which it's, uh, it, the decrease just is faster for 10 or 20 years, and then it slows down again. Um, the highest uh, bone mineral density is reached at about age 30, which we call peak bone mass, is genetically determined. So some people are luckier, like the blue uh, line person. Some people are less lucky, like the red line. And of course, it, this means that by starting with a lower peak bone mass, when then you start losing it as you age, you will have increased risk of osteoporosis and bone fractures. But um, the fact that this is genetically determined doesn't mean that diet and lifestyle are not important. They are needed so that we can actually reach the maximum peak bone mass that is genetically allowed. To do that, we need to have all those uh, dietary and lifestyle factors that we mentioned in our <laughs> previous slides. So peak bone mass is genetically determined, but adequate diet and lifestyle ensure that peak bone mass is reached up until you are 30, and then that... Um, the, the loss of bone mineral density is as slow as possible as you age. And again, you accomplish that with an adequate diet and lifestyle. So uh, bone mineral nutrition, um, bone health nutrition is very important, especially in the first part of your life, because that's when you actually build your bones and increase your bone mineral density. But then it keeps being important as you age to uh, slow down your loss. If this doesn't happen and your bone mineral density is very low, you have osteoporosis, which is a condition characterized by very low bone mineral density as diagnosed by a DEXA bone scan. And this will result in three 
main consequences, which are loss of hate, that's basically shrinking, and that's normal in elderly people, but with osteoporosis it's more pronounced. Body shape distortion, because you will have your crushing and wedging of your vertebra to have that body shape of the osteoporosis women which you have on your left side. And then, of course, increased risk of bone fractures because your uh, bones are less dense. And again, it is actually debated whether bone mineral density is the best predictor uh, for <laughs> bone fractures because there are some populations that have low bone mineral density but low rate of fractures because the elasticity of your bones, which is determined by the proteins in it, is also important. So we may need to reconsider, but this is certainly one important contributor. So the bone mineral density will um, ensure to minimize risk of bone fractures. All right, so iron. What you have here <laughs> is an apple with nails, iron nails in it. And back in the days when we didn't have supplements, this was an iron supplement. So the acidity in your apple would uh, take iron from the nails that you would, of course, remove the nails, eat the apple, and get plenty of iron to treat, for example, anemias. Iron is the most abundant trace mineral in our body. We have about three to four grams. Again, it's variable. Um, so you see much less than what we had calcium. We had one kilogram. Iron, we just have a few grams. We lose uh, very little. So iron is very precious. Our body is very good at recycling iron so that we only lose 1.5, 1 to 1.5 milligrams with cells from our <laughs> intestine, hair, sweat, skin, nails. However, we have a lot of iron in our bones, so uh, if we bleed, our losses may go dramatically higher, um, which is the reason why if the adult recommend daily allowance for iron is 8 milligrams, for uh, adult women until 50, and you would think it would make more sense to say until menopause, but the Food and Nutrition Board says that 50 is the age. They need twice, more than twice as much, so 18 milligrams to make up for blood loss with the menstrual cycle. We do also have an upper limit for iron. Iron is really a double-edged sword. We need it, it's very important, but as soon as we, we, we start having more than we need, it will have detrimental effects, because iron is a very, very strong pro-oxidant, so it will start uh, create oxidating damage, free radicals, damaging the structures in our body, our cells, uh, aging, and risk of cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So this is really one of those minerals for which we have to take the extra effort to get just about what we need. Not too much less, but even not too much more. And one of the main reasons why the multivitamin, multimineral supplements are divided by age. So in, in supplements for men or women uh, older than 50, you have much less iron because you do not want to promote oxidative damage. So question, why if uh, we only lose 1.5 milligrams per day, we need to eat 8 milligrams? So why do we need to eat so much more to make up for losing less? Oh, come on, I'm sure you know. Here's the answer. Um, because absorption is only partial. As with every mineral, uh, not everything that comes in with food actually gets absorbed. So absorption of iron is less than 20%, which means if we eat 8 milligrams, we will absorb about 1.5. Um, and again, it increases based on body needs. If we need more, we absorb more. Heme iron is better absorbed. So Half of the iron in meat and fish is in a structure called a hemigroup of hemoglobin and myoglobin that um, is slightly better absorbed at the rate of about 23%. The remaining iron in meat and fish and all the iron in vegetables uh, is non-heme iron and in absorption it's less and much more variable. It can range between <laughs> 2 and 20%. It is, however, enhanced by vitamin C, like we mentioned before, just a um, 20 milligrams of vitamin C, which is a few sips of orange juice, will double the absorption of iron from non heme food. If you eat um, non-heme iron with 
meat or fish, you end up increasing absorption of both, of iron from both sources, including the non-heme iron. And this is what we call the meat protein factor in meat and fish, which we don't exactly are sure of what it is. It may be heme iron itself, or more likely it is some proteins in meat that will bind to iron and increase absorption. But in the end, what, what we need to remember is that we, if we combine uh, a source of non-heme iron with meat or fish, we increase absorption. So for example, you eat your whole grain bread, you absorb so much. You eat a whole grain bread sandwich with turkey, the, no, the meat protein factor in turkey will increase absorption of iron even from the whole grain bread. And if you have a few slices of tomatoes, that's vitamin C, which even further uh, enhances absorption. And again, it is reduced by fiber, phytate, oxide, tannins. Uh, black tea is one of the worst enemies of iron, which is why if you uh, have to make up for deficiency or you need more, you probably don't want to drink tea with meals. Calcium and zinc interfere with absorption. Cooking also uh, at high temperature will uh, reduce iron absorption because uh, it will oxidize it, so um, that's inevitable. You, you, Again, one of the older remedies for uh, anemias to make up for iron was to eat raw liver with lemon juice because liver is organ meat is rich in iron. Raw uh, preserves its reduced and vitamin C keeps it reduced and binds it so you absorb a lot more. Um, so why is it so important? Um, iron is primarily, it is part of that heme group in hemoglobin in our red blood cells, enabling them to carry oxygen, so to transport oxygen to our tissues, and also to bring back uh, carbon dioxide to be ex expelled. And it is uh, in the same structure in myoglobin in muscle cells to uptake from red blood cells and temporarily store it until it is used to um, for oxidative uh, reactions to extract energy from the nutrients. It is also um, involved in energy metabolism. Iron is essential for the electron transport chain in our mitochondria to um, get energy from food. It is a cofactor of, 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 of many enzymes, and again, it does many, many different things. It's all the minerals, but those are the the main functions of, of iron. So it, it, it is needed to carry oxygen and store oxygen in our body. Can I move on? Oh, and many others. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, iron deficiency will lead to anemia. Anemia is any situation in which we have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of blood. So we have less iron, we don't, cannot make enough hemoglobin, our red blood cells cannot carry oxygen. Iron deficiency is not the only cause of anemia. Um, there are many other uh, causes, even nutritional causes of anemia, for example, lack of vitamin B12 or folate or B6 or copper. But iron deficiency anemia is the most common form of anemia, and it is the most common nutritional deficiency in the world. It will result in low levels of hemoglobin and uh, concentration of red blood cells, so you, have, you will have less red blood cells, smaller, pale, because they do not have hemoglobin, and which is the reason why they cannot as efficiently carry oxygen. And this will result in the um, characteristic symptoms of uh, anemia, which is paleness, uh, <coughs> fatigue after small efforts like running for a short while, climbing the stairs, uh, short breath, poor temperature regulation, you feel cold, have cold fingers, cold toes. There are some segments of the population that are at higher risk for anemia. Uh, well, women in their reproductive years, of course, but even more uh, during pregnancy and lactations. Child and infants that are growing will need more iron. Um, any time that you lose blood and maybe do not 
realize it, ulcers, colon cancer, parasite infections, which is a problem in develop, con developing countries. So they will uh, lose blood and iron with it. Athletes, some athletes, like marathon runner, uh, traditionally <coughs> tend to have a risk for iron deficiency. And again, it's never been really clarified the reason why. There are many hypotheses. It may be that by stomping their feet when they run, they break red blood cells and lose iron. But anyhow, they, they, they need to make sure they get enough and they do not, do not have deficiency. And also because you can lose with sweat, heavy sweating in tropical countries usually associated with uh, deficiency, parasite infections. It all contributes to increasing the risk for anemia. For the athletes, you said that they think it might be because they're stopping their feet when they run. Does that affect swimmers as well then? I, I honestly don't know. I would think if that's the reason, probably less. But, you know, and that, that may not be the reason. So it's just an observation that we make. I don't know if we have a functional explanation. And again, we said you, you want to make sure you have enough, but also you have to be careful not to have too much. As soon as you start having more, um, iron by itself, like we said, is a pro-oxidant, so you will have increased oxidative stress. Plus, once it's in our body, we cannot easily get rid of excess iron. We cannot easily excrete it. So we have to regulate it at absorption and intake. We go even higher. We have stomach irritation, nausea. This is typically a problem for those with anemia that have to take supplements of iron. We go even higher. We have acute toxicity, of course. And remember the... the the range is pretty high, not for, for acute toxicity, of course, but uh, if you think babies, it's easy for them. They take a couple pills of supplements of uh, supplemental iron, 60 milligrams, it's enough to kill a one-year-old. So that's why uh, individual um, high iron supplements have, have to be individually coated and have to take extra uh, measures to prevent uh, accidental ingestion. So, Hemochromatosis is a genetic condition um, involving iron absorption. Um, iron absorption is increased, and so it will deposit in the organs, leading to organ damage. It is pretty common. In Europe, it's even more uh, common. In the United States, uh, I think your book said one in 250 North Americans. And it may go undetected, meaning it's probably not screened at birth. So if it's undetected and you don't know, you, you may not realize it until it's too late, meaning until you have organ damage. Um, if it's detected, then iron intake must be strictly controlled from diet. And, and in the worst cases, you may need to donate blood to get rid of the extra iron. All right, so what are the food sources of iron? Shellfish has really a lot of iron. Organ meat also have a lot of iron, liver, kidneys, but you don't like it uh, here. Uh, lentils and beans can be good sources of iron. And meat and fish. Just do not uh, get the take home message that because you absorb more uh, of the iron from meat and fish, you only absorb iron from meat and fish. That's absolutely not true. You absorb slightly more of the iron in meat and fish, but it's only half of that that's him. The concentration of, of iron in muscle meat is not that exceptional. So if you eat liver, it's one thing. If you eat steak, it, it, it's another. And, and so you may end up absorbing more from an equivalent amount of lentils, for example, than to a, the same amount of steak especially if you enhance your non-heme iron absorption with lemon juice or orange juice or veggies that contain vitamin C. Whole grains, um, oatmeal, fruits and vegetables can contribute to your iron uh, requirements. And fortified foods, breakfast cereals. But remember, uh, again, like we said before, it's pretty close, the range between too little and too much. And this is even more complicated in the case of iron because you have some segments of the population that may be more at risk for deficiency, such as women in their uh, reproductive years. But there are other segments of the population that are actually at risk for uh, uh, iron excess toxicity. And so you want to be careful when you uh, fortify food. To meet the 8 milligrams 
recommended allowance for uh, men and older women, it's it really easy. Uh, you, you had this table, yes, and egg and dairy do not have significant amounts of iron. They are not good contributors to our amount. So what I wanted to show you is in this chart we have in our book, uh, to meet the eight milligrams requirements, oops, sorry, um, for male, a cup of spinach and a few beans will do it. Uh, you heat your turkey sandwich, you already have your 20 milligrams, you eat your chili with meat, with tomato sauce, so you will have your vitamin C, your meat protein factors, your, your beans. You, again, you get m more than double the intake for me. So it's easy to get to those 45, which is the upper limit. If you plus, you have your multivitamin and your fortified food, very likely you risk getting too much if you're at risk for uh, excess, if you have hemochromatosis and you don't know. So you, we have to think about that. We have some parts of the population that are at risk for deficiencies, but others that really do not want too much because we want to prevent that oxidative stress that's uh, caused by more iron than we actually need. Okay, um, that's about everything I wanted to say. I, um, if you have questions, <coughs> if you have five minutes. <coughs>